things often get worse before they get better. One of my children used to be uh, very worried uh, when the baddies are winning. And I had to explain to him that, you know, in a film or in a story, often, at some point, maybe most of the time, the baddies seem to be winning. Uh, but it's okay, the goodies normally win in the end. That's what makes a good story. It wouldn't be such a good fairy tale if when Prince Charming knocked on the tower, the wicked uncle just uh, welcomed him in with a big hug, says, come have a cup of tea with the princess, and off you go. Things often get worse before they get better. And that's what happens in today's Bible reading. It's what happens in our world. And I guess if we're honest, it's sometimes what happens in our lives. So I hope this will be really encouraging to us. Remember where we're up to? God has promised ancient Abraham and Sarah uh, land and people and blessing, and the promise is passed down to their son Isaac and to their son, his son Jacob. And Jacob and his whole family have gone to Egypt, and they've lived there and thrived for 400 years. And now they are the nation of the Hebrews, or the Israelites. And in probably the 15th century BC, Pharaoh's trying to squash the Egypt, the Hebrews rather, by enslaving them and killing their boys. Uh, but one boy slipped through the net, and it's Moses. And now, many years later, God appears to Moses, and he said, go, go and bring my people out of Egypt, bring them to the promised land. He's going to keep his promises. Today, the curtain goes up as Moses and his spokesman, uh, his brother Aaron, uh, go into Pharaoh's palace. Uh, they ring on Pharaoh's doorbell, and we wait on the doorstep. What's going to happen? Well, things are going to get worse before they get better. Uh, look down with me, would you? Chapter 5 and verse 1. Afterwards, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh, and they said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, Let my people go, so that they may hold a festival to me in the wilderness. Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. The big question in this chapter is, what if God's rescuer seems to make things worse? What if God's rescuer seems to make things worse? Picture Moses and Aaron walking into that cavernous, I imagine, palace. Uh, no chit-chat, uh, no cup of tea. Just straight in there, let my people go, they say. And God's rescue seems to make things worse because immediately it's Pharaoh against God. And you can picture Pharaoh there on his great throne. I guess he would have had that, is it a cobra on his, on his headdress? Uh, looking, at, looking phenomenal. But on his face is a sneer, who is the Lord that I should, let, that I should obey him? Now, I don't think it's an intellectual question. I don't think Pharaoh is saying, mm, I'm sure that's fine. Just refresh me. Uh, who, who is this Lord we're talking about? I don't think it's that. Moses has just told Pharaoh who the Lord is. He's the God of Israel. No, this is Pharaoh against God. Who on earth does this Lord think he is telling me what to do with my slaves? Uh, just as, as an aside, you may be wondering why Moses and Aaron uh, seem to ask only for permission to go to a festival. Um, and not the kind of festival we have in this country, I guess. But even so, um, why does he ask permission only to uh, go make sacrifices in the desert? Are, are they tricking Pharaoh into thinking that they'll come back? And uh, commentators agree, Pharaoh would have understand, understood this was just stage one. I'm rescued slaves, don't, don't, don't come back. They're gone. So it's Pharaoh against God. Who is this Lord that I should obey him? And God's rescuer seems to make things worse. But of course that serpent, uh, um, as it were, on Pharaoh's headdress has always sneered at God. Ever since he hissed at Eve in the garden, did God really say? Ever since he hissed at Jesus in the desert, bow down and worship me. Satan has always tried to enslave God's people. He's always been against God. 
So when we feel that being a Christian is hard, uh, let's not be offended. Let's not feel victimized or too sorry for ourselves. But remember Jesus' words. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. Bearer against God. Maybe we say, yes, but God's rescue does seem to make things worse. Because it's not just Pharaoh against God, it's also Pharaoh against God's people. Pharaoh against God's people. So Moses and Aaron leave, maybe with their tails between their legs, thinking, what have we got into here? Now we see Pharaoh still there, um, furious by the sounds of it, finger stabbing, eyes furious. And, and in, in come the slave drivers. I mean, I guess the slave drivers also line up. Uh, big, scary guys with cruel whips, and Pharaoh barks out his orders. Verse 6, can you see? Chapter 5, verse 6. That same day, Pharaoh gave this order to the slave drivers and overseers in charge of the people. You are no longer to supply the people with straw for making bricks. Let them go and gather their own straw, but require them to make the same number of bricks as before. Don't reduce the quota. They are lazy. That is why they are crying out, let us go and sacrifice to our God. Now it really is Pharaoh against God's people. Can you picture the Hebrews' um, uh, backs breaking out in those sun-baked fields? And they've been used to to mixing that mud, I don't know whether they trampled it with their feet or how, somehow making uh, those bricks. They're used to that, but they need, they need um, straw to reinforce those bricks. And suddenly, Pharaoh makes their work twice as hard. They've been used to the lorry load of straw arriving each day, to, uh, enough straw for the day, but now he says, no, you go and fetch the straw for yourselves. And you can imagine them running around like headless chickens, like a DVD on fast forward, because Pharaoh says, you've got to make them at the same rate. So you've got to get the straw too. And now, verse 14, because they can't do it, the Hebrew managers, so the Hebrew kind of overseers, they're getting beaten up by the Egyptians. Pharaoh against God's people. Still today, Satan is against God's people, isn't he? Uh, 5,000 Christians in Myanmar, a flee after the army bombed their village. Every week brings news of more Christians killed in Nigeria. By comparison with that, we have it relatively easy, don't we? But still, maybe we feel sometimes like following God's rescue seems to have made things worse. Like following Jesus sometimes has maybe brought us more trouble. Maybe as our culture and our laws slowly move away from their Christian tradition, we can foresee a day when some Christian practices or beliefs may become illegal. Maybe we've ex experienced a coldness or barbed comments or even rejection from friends or loved ones uh, for following Jesus. Maybe our Christian service has cost us or cost our loved ones a lot of time or money um, or stress. Maybe the Bible's teaching on relationships seems painful. Maybe we feel torn between two masters, torn between Jesus and the world. And will we act with integrity? And that tension is exhausting. But as the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 4, don't be surprised at the painful trial you're suffering, as though something strange were happening to you. Pharaoh against God. They're against God's people. And sometimes it's God's people are against God's rescuer. God's people against God's rescuer. Look down with you at verse 20. When they left Pharaoh, they found Moses. This, this is the, the Israelite overseers who are being beaten up. Okay, Verse 20. When they left Pharaoh, they found Moses and Aaron waiting to meet them. And they said, may the Lord look on you and judge you. You have made us obnoxious to Pharaoh and his officials and have put a sword in their hands to kill us. Moses returned to the Lord and said, Why, Lord, why have you brought trouble on this people? 
Is this why you sent me? Ever since I went to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has brought trouble on his people, and you have not rescued your people at all. When God's rescue seems to have made things worse, sometimes God's people turn against God's rescuer. That's the shock in this passage. We expect Pharaoh to be against God's people. We know that. The shock is that now God's people are against Moses, against God's rescuer. And the shock today is when God's people are against Jesus. In Jesus' day, it was the religious leaders who most vehemently opposed him. And even Jesus' own disciples sometimes stood against him, didn't they? And the Apostle Paul was often opposed by Christians or those who called themselves Christians. What if God's rescue seems to make things worse today? What if God sometimes feels like that, that friend or that loved one who, who steps into our situation thinking they can make things better for us, but they actually just make it worse. What if it feels like that with Jesus? Of course, when we struggle, it's right and proper that we cry out to God, and he welcomes it when we cry out to him. But what if that turns into bitter or angry words against God, or hatred against other Christians? How to deal with that? Well, if God's rescuer seems to make things worse, here is the answer. Secondly and finally, look to the Lord. Look to the Lord for the future. Uh, This is chapter 6, verse 1 to 12. Look to the Lord for the future. Chapter 6, verse 1, can you see it? Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. Because of my mighty hand, he will let them go. Because of my mighty hand, he will drive them out of his country. Now, how does God talk to Moses? It just says God talks to him. Uh, does, does he meet him? Is it a dream? Well, we don't know. But somehow God talks to Moses and says, as it were, Moses, look to the Lord and look to the future. Look to the Lord. I've called this Bible series in Exodus, This is Our God. And again and again in our Bible reading, God says, I am the Lord. So verse 2, he says, I am the Lord. Verse 6, I am the Lord. Verse 7, halfway through verse 7, I am the Lord. Verse 8, end of verse 8, I am the Lord. Look to the Lord. Hang on, God. You say in verse 3 that in the past, by your name, the Lord, you did not make yourself fully known. But we've read Genesis. This name, the Lord, comes up 183 times in Genesis. Abraham and Isaac and Genesis and Jacob and Genesis. Abraham and Isaac and Jacob all directly called God the Lord. Uh, how is this name new? Anyway, when you preached about God's name two weeks ago, we know about this name. Ah, oh, but do we? Look at verse three more carefully with you. Verse three, can we see it? God said, verse three, I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself fully known to them. Do you know what? (laughs) I must apologize. My Bible translation at home has the word fully there, and I was going to make a big big deal out of this. So I apologize on behalf of the translators. I I try not to criticize translators, but it really ought to have the word fully there. Um, Verse 3. Let's try this again. End of verse 3, by my name the Lord, I did not make myself fully known to them. It really is there. I asked my four-year-old Lucy this week. I said, Lucy, uh, do you know what your middle name is? And uh, she said, uh, yes, she said, I know my middle name. She said, my middle name is Joy. Well done, Lucy. I said, Lucy, do you know what Joy means? No. No. And I had to explain to her what her middle name meant. For years she's known her name, but she's not fully known it. Uh, yes, those ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, they knew God's label, the Lord. They knew that as a label. 
Uh, in fact, they knew in their language that name was Yahweh, which means literally, I am. But they didn't fully know it, because they didn't know its full meaning. I, I, I am? I mean, what does that mean? I, I am what? I will be, I, I will be what? How could they fully know the meaning of that name? And it's not until the Exodus that God really reveals what it is that I am is, that, that he is, what it is that I will be. To reveal himself by his mighty hand as the God who rescues, the God who rules, and the God who relates. I am the Lord. I am the Lord, compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet, he does not leave the guilty unpunished. That's Exodus 34. Let's look to the Lord. What if God's rescuer seems to make things worse? What if following Jesus seems harder than not following him? Let's look to the Lord. I spend far too much time looking down, looking down at myself, looking down at my screen, looking down at the world, looking down at other people. Let's look to the Lord. What about you? Perhaps another generation of Christians was better uh, at practicing the presence of God, at being conscious of God with them in every moment. Uh, yes, in their daily quiet time. Uh, yes, each week at church. Uh, but also in, in everyday life. Uh, looking to God in that tricky meeting at work. Looking to the Lord when you feel lost in a crowd in the playground or the classroom. Looking to the Lord when you're at home, alone, but you're not on your own because you're looking to the Lord. Let's look to the Lord. And look to the Lord for the future. Let me read from verse 6 and look for that phrase, I will. Verse 6. Therefore say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians, and I will bring you to the land I swore with uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. So here's the great I am, and here's the great I will. So let's look to the Lord for the future. I will bring you out. I will free you. I will redeem you. And then that wonderful phrase in verse 7, which is God's love story in a nutshell. Verse 7, I will take you as my own people and be your God. Now, in a sense, as Christians, we look back to the future. In a sense, we look back to God's promises coming true when Jesus lived and died, and uh, died in our place and buried our, our, our blame and our shame. Uh, in the ground and, and rose from the dead to prove he is the way back to life and ascended to reign. In a sen sense, we look back to the future. If we've entrusted our lives to that risen Savior as our Lord, then we have been rescued uh, from sin and death and judgment. In that sense, we look back. But in another sense, Christians still look forward to our rescue in the future. God says, I will bring you to the land I swore with uplifted hands to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And even that promised land with its, its um, streams of milk and uh, honey, so to speak, was just an architect sketch of the vast and glorious new heavens and new earth that God will bring, that Jesus will bring any moment now. So look to the Lord for the future. God says in the Bible, Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. 1 John chapter 3. Friends, when God's rescuer seems to make things worse, look to the Lord for the future. I, 
I'm guessing, I think they're probably right. I'm guessing those Christians driven from their homes in Myanmar, those Christians who've lost, lost loved ones in Nigeria, I'm guessing they think about the future, about heaven, more than we do. Uh, because they're less distracted by the things of this time than we are. Sometimes Christians are accused of being so heavenly minded that they have no earthly use. But if we are truly heavenly minded, then it will be of true earthly use. It's a bit like, um, imagine uh, uh, you, you, you're tidying your house. Or maybe someone you live with is tidying your house. And um, uh, the, the, you get out everything, and they get out everything and lay it everywhere. And it looks worse. You come and you're like, what are you doing here? You've made, you've made a bomb site. Um, but there is a method in their madness. And um, uh, it, it, uh, they've got a system, and, and it will soon be tidy. Things get worse before they get better. But if I have no vision of the goal, I, I won't understand what's going on here. But I, if I have a vision, oh, yeah, they're making the room tidy. Then I'll trust them and go with it. See, what were the Hebrews meant to do with God's revelation? Were they meant immediately to down tools, pack their swimming costume, and uh, head off into the sunset? Not yet. From now, I guess, they were to carry on making bricks and fetching straw. But they were to make bricks with hope and not fear. They were to make bricks knowing their true identity, that they were not slaves of Pharaoh, but slaves of the Lord. To make bricks not for the present pride of Egypt, but for the greater glory of God. To make bricks today, knowing that rescue would come tomorrow, looking to the Lord for the future. How can we look to the Lord for the future? Maybe God is calling someone here into full-time gospel ministry of some kind. I have a word if that's you. But for many of us, the application is to keep going, to keep making bricks uh, in whatever way we normally do, at work, at school, or in college, in retirement. But to make bricks with hope and not fear knowing our identity does not come first and foremost as a bricklayer or whatever we are, but first and foremost as a servant of God. Living not for the pounds or the power or the prestige, but living for the glory of God. Making bricks today, knowing that Jesus could come tomorrow, looking to the Lord for the future. See, things get worse before they get better. And one of my boys used to worry when the baddies are winning. But now he knows not to worry when it looks like the baddies are winning. Because that means you're, you're maybe near the end. And it's maybe about to get exciting. It's okay. The goodies win in the end. So what if God's rescuer seems to make things worse? Let's look to the Lord for the future. Until the day when the Lord himself will come down from heaven. And the dead in Christ will rise first. And after that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And we will be with the Lord forever. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Before Nick concludes in prayer, we're going to sing.